Good morning and welcome to Greenwell Street Devotional. If you're just first time watching, I'm Robert McCormick, I'm one of the elders, and it's someone different each morning. Let's just begin with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we again come into your presence. It's our privilege, it really is a privilege to be able to come into your presence, Lord. It's so easy to take it for granted. So easy to just say our Father and just come on and say what we want, give a whole list of the things we want from you and forget that you're the God of creation. You're the God who made everything. You made us, Lord. Everything that we see, everything that we know, everything that is about us, your hands been on it. Six days you made all in creation. On the sixth day at the end you made man. From the dust of the ground and you breathed into him and made him a living soul. You made woman from man and right through creation, Lord, you've been in charge. And we forget that, Lord. We forget that so often. There's so much we think that we do, so much that we think that we're in charge of, so much we think we can control. And the truth of the matter is, you sit in heaven and you look down. And there must be times when you're disappointed. There must be times when you look down at your creation and wonder should you send judgment or blessings. Lord, we thank you for the blessings you've given us. We can say our Father this morning not because it's just a word that someone's taught us to say. We say it because on a hillside outside Jerusalem, a place called Calvary, your son paid the penalty for our sins. So we have that right now to come into your presence and say, Our Father. So for that great privilege this morning, we just say thank you. And forgive us when we take it for granted. For we ask it in the name of Jesus. Amen. Our reading this morning is found in the book of Daniel. Daniel chapter 6. And just, we're going to read a few verses beginning to read at verse 19. It's a very well known story. At the first light of dawn, the king got up and hurried to the lion's den. When he came near the den, he called to Daniel in an anguished voice, Daniel, servant of the living God, has your God, whom you serve continually, been able to rescue you from the lions? Daniel answered, O king, live forever. My God sent his angel, and he shut the mouth of the lions. They have not hurt me, because I was found innocent in his sight. Nor have I have ever done anything wrong before you, O king. The king was overjoyed and gave orders to lift Daniel out of the den. When Daniel was lifted from the den, no wound was found on him, because he had trusted in his God. At the king's command, the men who had falsely accused Daniel were brought in and thrown into the lion's den, along with their wives and children. And before they reached the floor of the den, the lions overpowered them and crushed all their bones. Then King Darius wrote to all the peoples, nations and men of every language throughout the land, May you prosper greatly. I issue a decree that in every part of my kingdom people must fear and reverence the God of Daniel. For he is a living God and he endures forever. His kingdom will not be destroyed. His dominion will never end. He rescues and he saves. He performs signs and wonders in the heavens and on the earth. He has rescued Daniel from the power of the lands. So Daniel prospered during the reign of Darius and the reign of Cyrus the Persian. Enton at verse 28. You know, this is a very well-known story and it's so easy to read this and see that as it all. But really, remember, God is in charge. This story doesn't start here. This story, story goes two kings back. man called Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon. He has actually brought down to capture Jerusalem and the people there the tribes of Judah, for the simple reason that the people of God have left God. And God allows this foreign king to come down and to capture his people. It's their fault they've left God. So Nebuchadnezzar takes Daniel, he takes Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego, and he takes many others back to Babylon, and they will stay there for years upon years. But God has promised he was going to take them there. They didn't believe him, but it happens, they go. But at the same time, Nebuchadnezzar takes the gold and silver from the temple. 
and he just puts it in the treasury of his God. He doesn't use it, he doesn't melt it down, he doesn't have any use for it. He just puts it with the rest of the treasure that he owns. And that's where the story begins. This Babylonian king is sent to chastise God's people who have left the worship of God. Time comes. Nebuchadnezzar will even learn about the God of Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego. He will put them into a fiery furnace and find out that the God of Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego is not his gods. This God is a God who hears and a God who answers. And even Nebuchadnezzar's attitude will change, not only towards them, but towards the God that they worship. He passes on and this other man now comes up, Belshazzar. Belshazzar is now king, different in many ways. Nebuchadnezzar has been blessed by God in many ways because of what he has done. He's in God's hands. So is Belshazzar. Little does he realise it. Belshazzar this day has a great party. A thousand nobles are invited. His wives and concubines are invited. And the drink flows. The food flows. Everything's going great. Until you know, after a while, as we would always say, the drink takes the better of him. And he remembers of the gold and silver goblets that have been taken from the Jews. So he orders them to be brought in. He fills them up with wine. They all drink from them. And he starts to praise his gods with the God's temple of Jerusalem's silver and gold. It's God's silver and gold. So on himself he has just brought the wrath of God. Everything's going great until his finger like a man's hand writes in the wall, meaning, meaning, tickle, parson. No one can understand what it means until he sends for Daniel. And Daniel tells him that his kingdom is taken from him he has been weighed in the balances, and that night his life will be taken from him. See, God is not mocked, even by a king of Babylon. Darius the maid comes and takes over the whole country, takes over the Babylonian Empire. And again, he's a man who likes Daniel. This man, Daniel, that he meets, has just been made the third ruler in the kingdom He's honest. You can believe what he does. He has wisdom. But the trouble is the satraps and the administrators in Babylon hate him because they don't have these principles. They're not honest. <laughs> They're not very good at their job either. So they actually plan to get rid of Daniel. And this is where we read this mighty plan that Darius will make a rule. The rule is if anybody is worshipping anybody except him, then they're in trouble, and Daniel being Daniel, prays to God three times a day, and they know about this. And because of the law and meets and persons, it's something written down, cannot be changed. Darius must keep his word, and he has to put Daniel in the land, down the lands. But he doesn't sleep that night. And that's where we read what we read this morning. <coughs> At first light, this king can't even sleep. He gets up and he calls Daniel, Servant of the living God, has your God, whom you serve, continually been able to rescue you? Yes, king, don't worry, I'm here. But you see, all this time, you find out what is actually ending up here. Darius makes this edict. I issue a decree that in every part of my kingdom, people must fear and reverence the God of Daniel. Remember, this began because the people of God would not worship God as they should. They had went after all our gods. God sends judgment through Nebuchadnezzar. Now Darius, this maid, comes there. He's a heathen. Doesn't know the God of the Bible. What does he say here? For he is a living God and he endures forever. His kingdom will not be destroyed. His dominion will never end. He rescues and he saves. He performs signs and wonders in the heavens and on the earth. He has rescued Daniel from the power of the lands. So Daniel prospered during the reign of Darius and the reign of Cyrus the king. You see, God's ways aren't our ways. It doesn't make a lot of sense, you see, maybe to us. But God had planned this, as he's planned everything. As he's planned your life and he's planned my life. 
and he's planned all that's going out there at the minute. God's in charge. Whether the world believes it or whether the world doesn't believe it, it's totally irrelevant. Darius, this maid, could see what the world can't see today. For the God of Daniel and the God of us is a living God and he endures forever. His kingdom will not be destroyed, his dominion will never end. So don't panic about the world's doom. Don't panic that the world seems to have no time for God. God knows. God is still in charge, regardless of what governments say, regardless of what politicians say, regardless of what rules and regulations are brought in. God's Ten Commandments still stand. God's word in the Bible still stands. He still rescues and he saves. He performs signs and wonders in the heaven and on the earth. And the God that this man Darius saw in Daniel is the God that we have. The same God. So you know, don't panic at what the paper says this morning. Don't lose sleep over what the news says. The God of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob, the God of Darius, the God of Daniel, the God of the Old and New Testament is your God and my God if you know that Christ is your Saviour. We may have concerns. That's not of worries. God's in charge. You know, as I read this, I couldn't help think of the wee chorus we used to sing, you know, trust and obey, for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus, but to trust and obey. And maybe that's what we need to do. Trust and obey. Not the world. God. And maybe this morning you've listened to this and it didn't make a lot of sense. It's because, like some of those we heard this morning, they don't believe in the God of the Bible. The God of the Bible is the one we can truly trust and we can truly obey. But only if we know Christ as our Saviour. If we don't know him as our Saviour, then there's no one we can trust in. There's no one we can obey. Because there's nothing to hold on to. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you that your word is truly old. But ever new as we, course, would have said, yes, it is old. But regardless how often we go to it, regardless how often we read it, it's always new. It's always something that we learn from. It's also something that shows us again the God of the Bible. The God of all power, all knowledge, all seeing. The God who has no beginning and no end. The God who knows our rising up and our lying down. And the God who planned an eternity to save a people unto himself, a people who would be like the stars in the sky, like a sand in the seashore, they could not be numbered. Lord, we thank you that we who have been to Jesus know we are part of that vast number. But Lord, there may be some this morning and they don't know that. Well, they would like to know it, but they have no assurance. They're holding on to things of the world, hoping that that'll be sufficient. But Lord, you know, as the Chorus says, one way God said to get to heaven, Jesus is the only way. And it hasn't changed in 2,000 years. And it won't change now. So Lord, for we who know you this morning, thank you. Thank you for our salvation. And for those who are still outside, it's still the day of grace. It's still the day when the vilest sinner can be drawn into the kingdom by the grace and mercy of God through Christ Jesus, in whose name we pray. Amen.